What is going on guys and girls, it's Ghost Robo and welcome finally to my Game of the Year video 2015. This features my top 10 games of 2015 and I know it's a little late, I know it's kind of overdue. I always want this video to be big and bold and beautiful and perfect, but I'm usually run down and sick and tired in December and January so it ends up getting put off and off and off and off and then like last year I totally never got around to getting it done so I figured you know what we'll make it discussion oriented and we'll just get it done with a little bit of gameplay a whole lot of thought and 10 very awesome games so this is my list my opinions what I put upon my top 10 games of 2015 curious to know what you guys think of the list and what yours were let me know in the comments below hopefully you'll find one or two in here that you didn't play in 2015 and maybe it'll bring you some fun some joy uh, as we kick off the gaming season here in 2016 so without further ado ghost robo's top 10 game of the year games 2015 begins right now with number 10 Super Mario Maker. I really, really wish I could put this one higher on my list because I love the creativity that it just seems to pull from everyone. I see young kids enjoying this game. I see people in their teens enjoying this game. I see full-grown adults who grew up with Mario enjoying this game. And everybody is making levels, playing levels, and really just showing how much awesome stuff can be done with the simple controls and the simple, bright, fun, mechanically sound gameplay of Mario. The reason I can't put it any higher is because I skipped out on a full 50% of this game, which is the creation side of things. I'm just not the person to spend hours making a level. I don't have the patience. I don't have the desire. And so for me, Mario Maker was an online collection of other people's levels, which was super fun. And I love seeing what people come up with. I had one of my favorite gaming moments of the year playing the Super Meat Bros stage from Game Explain and beating that, doing something that's super hard and had such a low completion rate was really rewarding and super fun. I love the levels that Nintendo creates based on 3DS games or based on events or even the ones that are kind of goofy with partners like Southwest Airlines, all the different costumes you can get, the way they've integrated Amiibo. I think it's a super, super fun game. I hope that it continues to stay popular and I'd love to see them eventually release DLC. But I have to put it at number 10 because I only use a little bit of it. Nonetheless, I think this is one of the coolest games that came out in 2015, not just from Nintendo, not just on Wii U, but in general, because it evokes a whole different feel and a whole different concept than pretty much anything else released. I think it even is a more sound creation tool than stuff like Little Big Planet or, or RPG Maker, things like that that you'll see because it basically makes you a masterful Nintendo designer. They give you the tools, they provide the structure, and then you just have to use your creativity to put it in and the levels are going to turn out pretty darn good even in their simplest forms. Stuff like Little Big Planet could get screwed up very easily. You run into a lot of errors, bad jumps, misaligned this, that, and the other thing. But Mario Maker seems to find a way to ensure quality in even the dumbest levels. And I like that everything feels pretty sound. Sure, there's lots of silly levels and ones that are nothing but run across the screen or sit there and do absolutely nothing. But more often than not, I found myself smiling, laughing, and loving my time with the different levels that I played. Coming in at number 9, we have Star Wars Battlefront, a game that I didn't think would crack this list whatsoever due to the dearth of content, the absence of single player, and the sad, sad exclusion of any real Episode 7 content. But Star Wars Battlefront is fun, and that's what counts most of all. I find myself able to return to this game over and over because of its unique and easygoing gameplay, as opposed to something like Call of Duty where your skill can deteriorate quite quickly and requires a big and gradual ramp up back to proficiency, Battlefront seems to invite you back with open arms. I'm able to take weeks off, come back, and still do well and enjoy my time. And that says a lot about the shooter that DICE has invented here. I know that they bothered a lot of people by going the more casual route and not just reskinning Battlefield, but I'm glad that they did. I think Battlefront holds its own in its own unique space, and I'd be okay with them making a new one every year or two, so long as the Star Wars franchise continues to grow and blossom. It would be fun to encounter new characters, new eras, and new lands underneath the umbrella of the Battlefront series. 
series. It is missing content. It is a little bit of a lackluster purchase at $60, but I think it's super fun. The servers have held up well. Almost every match I play is close, and I generally enjoy all the maps and all the characters. I wish Kylo and Finn and Rey were involved, but playing as Palpatine, Vader, and Luke is kind of a really cool dream come true, and I'm hoping that the DLC in the form of the monthly free updates and the paid season pass will expand this in a way that brings it more together in the form of a full-fledged multiplayer package. I'd love to see the inclusion of many more heroes, villains, modes, maps, and hey, that's exactly what we're going to get, so it will only get better from here, and I really just, it's the perfect Star Wars game, I think. Of course, we wish there was single player, and that will be coming from Visceral and maybe even Battlefront 2, but for what they set out to make, I think they did a great job, and if you think of this as a licensed game, it is a darn good licensed game. The graphics are absolutely beautiful, there are a lot of modes. The maps are not varied in a geometry sense very much, but they are varied from a visual perspective, and I like the way that the maps shrink and expand depending on the mode. I find myself enjoying the smaller modes, the team deathmatch, but what's most surprising to me is that I like the bigger modes, which I normally don't play at all in other shooters. So stuff like Walker Assault is really fun for me. Even some of the more oddball choices like Droid Run are really enjoyable. And I see myself playing Battlefront throughout not only 2015, but also 2016, which is surprising because in most games, I get tired of them quite quickly. So the fact that this has held my attention and remains fun is pretty darn cool. I wish that Battlefront had single player. I wish that it had Episode 7 content. I wish that it was everything it could have been. But for what it is and how much fun it brought me, it definitely deserves a place on my list. At number 8, we have Rocket League, one of the most balls-to-the-wall fun games of the year. Quite literally balls-to-the-wall because you're playing soccer with cars. Crazy idea, silly concept, yet the execution is masterful. I played this with YouTube friends, I played this with real-life friends, I played this with brothers, I played this with parents, I played it by myself, and it always was a blast. It's one of the best split-screen games of this generation, and... At its price point, you really can't do a whole lot better. I find it infinitely replayable. They continue to add content, mix things up, and it has garnered quite a bit of competitive attention. You can see some people doing crazy things on YouTube and pulling off some insanely skilled moves. I love the fact that the proficiency level is really, really uh, disparate. You can have people who are you know, bare bones beginners, and you can have people who are flying through the air doing flips and tricks and scoring at will. I love the concept here. It's kind of like a good sports game. It's very simple. What you do is easy to explain, easy to play, but to master it takes a long, long time, and it's pretty much infinitely replayable. Even if there isn't a whole lot of, quote, content there, the content is in the exuberance and the excitement you feel within each round. It was my favorite game to play with my siblings this year, which is a huge deal for me because I grew up gaming with my brothers. And so to find something that we could play online or split screen right next to each other, uh, even four player split screen was a great, great addition to the 2015 slate. I know it's based on an idea from the past, but here they really nailed it and they really polished everything to perfection. I'm glad it's been as successful as it has been. I can't wait to see what they make next. If there's some other way they can combine, you know, both in football or airplanes and basketball, give it to me because soccer and cars sounded like a horrible match and yet this was the most beautiful blend of 2015. Number seven is Black Ops 3 and this was a really tricky one for me to place. I wavered between having Battlefront at seven and Black Ops at nine, Black Ops at seven and Battlefront at nine and ultimately I decided that Black Ops 3 is just flat out the better game and at some level it's not just what I had the most fun with but what I think is the best game and Black Ops 3 is a better game than Battlefront. The package, the value proposition is insane, the multiplayer is near perfect and the single player was pretty darn solid as well. That's not even to mention Black Ops 3 Zombies mode, which is super cool and just gives you a gargantuan amount of hours of content and value and fun to be had. I wish I had more time for this one. I know I can be good at Call of Duty. I love it when I'm good at Call of Duty, and I really love it when I'm good and playing Call of Duty Black Ops 3, but other games came, and I don't find myself being the kind of guy that could commit hundreds of hours to one multiplayer game. And that's something that I mentioned about Battlefront that gave it a little bit of an advantage. But ultimately, the maps, the guns, 
everything about Black Ops 3 just spoke to me and said, this is great, and this is quality, and this is really, really enjoyable. Their mechanics are so sound, that shooting system is nearly perfect at this point. And I really liked the way that zombies uh, kind of got modified. You had some of the old maps that brought back that feel, and then you had a new map that was massive and introduced new mechanics. Um, a lot of the side features as well, like the different keys and all of that, I didn't even dive into, but it's there for people who want to be super hardcore. I think the specialist is a fun way to expand upon the multiplayer format in a way that isn't just adding kill streaks or modifying the point system or adding some new skins, but really changing up the gameplay and encouraging everyone uh, to get in and have some fun because now it's possible to get a cool kill streak even if you suck, which is something that Call of Duty has struggled with. Other games go too overboard in the other direction, something like Titanfall giving way too much power, I feel, to everyone. But Black Ops 3 seemed to strike a really nice balance, having the specialist grant everyone at least a moment of potential glory, but ultimately your skill level and your prowess dictates who is the most awesome gamer and the most awesome player in each individual session. I love 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 black ops 3 i hope to play it a lot in 2016 can't wait for the dlc expanding both the multiplayer and the zombies components but man oh man this is probably the best 60 dollars you can spend straight up value wise and i really like it it earns its seventh spot it's a great step for call of duty and i'm glad that they're back on track making really good games once again number six is probably the oddball of my lit Number six is SteamWorld Heist, and this is probably the oddball of my list. I doubt most people have this one on there anywhere, but SteamWorld Heist is so good. We talked about value with Call of Duty. Here you have a different kind of value, but still super duper value nonetheless. It's cheap, it's a 3DS eShop game, but it is so freaking cool. They did an incredible job of making a turn-based strategy game with real-time aiming work from a 2D perspective. It seems like it'd be super simplistic. It seems like it'd be super boring and easy. But alas, SteamWorld Heist is so freaking cool. I want to say dope, but I know that would be kind of lame. So I'll just say cool, but know that I'm thinking dope because SteamWorld Heist, I love it. The robots, the whole steampunk vibe and world, the fact that you get to aim and equip all this different loot and new guns, you get to pick your team, you acquire and recruit new robots and then get to decide who you want to send out to battle. There's optional missions for more loot. There's harder challenge missions for more loot. There's even crazy hats like in Team Fortress 2. Uh, it's got a lot of personality. The music is really great. The graphics are just this nice, crisp, hand-drawn looking animated style. And it builds on a universe that seems like it would have no place even having another game in its universe, the Steam World universe, which started with Steam World Dig, an amazing game in its own right, didn't come out in 2015 though, but Steam World Lies is a must play. I know it may not look like your cup of tea, but I promise you this is one of the most addictive and purely fun experiences that we had all year. It's got great mechanics, great charm, and a fun storyline coupled with just really great characters and a battle system that has been done before, but I feel like is refined and reworked in a way that makes strategy as fun as something much more action-oriented. You have to give SteamWorld Heist a try. If you have a 3DS or if you're looking to pick up a 3DS, this is up there in the top couple games ever made for that system. Now we get to the tough part, the top five, where any of these games could have been rearranged in any order, and I probably would have been happy. All of these are so good, and I enjoyed so much. It was super, super tough for me to know where exactly to put them, how to rank them, and how I decided. I'll explain a little bit of my thought process with each one, but we start off with number five, Life is Strange. Gosh, I love Life is Strange. I love Max. I love the concept, I love the freaking creepy, weird, and almost just uncomfortable ending, I love the time mechanics, I love the production value, I love how it feels like a, a TV show, I love that you have direct control of the character, but it's also an adventure game with choices and conversational options. I love how you go from era to era and you actually move through situations multiple times and see different outcomes it's so so cool i do have a few gripes of the game i wish that your decisions 
had a bigger impact on the ending. I wish that they were able to find a way to diverge the paths a little bit more. But alas, the accomplishments here are superb. They took a female main character. They took an a preppy art school uh, environment. They took a really dark villain and really dark theme and concept that I won't spoil. Notice I'm only showing footage from the very first episode and the very first part of that episode because if you haven't played it, you have to. But they took these unlikely components and blended them together into a delicious smoothie that's worthy of any Jamba Juice or any Smoothie King on any street corner in any city in the world. It's just a masterful, masterful game, and I love their storytelling. I think that they did a, a, a really great job of creating mystery and intrigue, dare I say, better than even The Walking Dead. I think The Walking Dead has a lot of engagement and a lot of uh, value in its own right, don't get me wrong, but something about Life is Strange, the way that they almost calmly bring about this really moving story is pretty remarkable. It deals with death. It deals with a lot of dark themes. It, it, I don't. Some of them I'm shocked that they decided to tackle, but boy, did they do a really good job. I feel like they were respectful. I feel like they were mature. I feel like even though some of the dialogue at times got a little goofy or a little silly, all in all, this was a game that captured emotion and captured heartfelt feelings and characters so well and put on paper real believable scenarios and made you feel right along with them. People always talk about crying over The Walking Dead and their reaction to the last episode and things like that, but I feel like Life is Strange struck an even deeper nerve. I feel like they tapped into much more personal emotions and much more relatable fears and victories, joys and sorrows than The Walking Dead, which ultimately grabs you on a lot of shock value and a lot of death and destruction, uh, but Life is Strange, man, it just it just has a vibe all its own, and that was something that was really important to me this year in my list. I thought unique vibes were really, really cool and really important, and I cannot wait to see what Don't Nod does next, supposedly some weird vampire game. Super excited for that. Really hope Life is Strange gets a second season, and I'm glad that a game about a girl going to art school with time powers, a downloadable that had bad lip syncing and not the best graphics, was able, able to grab as much attention as it did and really really, really strike a chord with so many people. Life is Strange is another one of the must, must, must plays on this list for anybody. Go grab it. Go play it now. It is so, so special. Number four is another adventure game with a twist, this time Until Dawn. I had no idea that this would be as good as it was. Another one that was a total surprise, and if I had to make a top five surprises list, this may be at the top of the heat because I went in expecting a hokey horror adventure and came out with a really, really intense, awesome adventure that finally implemented change in the ending and in the game based on your decision in the form of totally removing characters, dialogue, and situations from the game, and I came out on the other side with a girlfriend as well. Yes, Becca, my girlfriend, first found me and even knew who I was based on Until Dawn, but that is not why it's a good game. It's a great game because even though the parts themselves aren't the best, it doesn't have, you know, the coolest gameplay, it doesn't have the most believable storyline, what it comes together as is wholly unique. And again, it's kind of an interesting contrast to some of the games that have already been on this list where maybe the mechanics aren't super perfect and pro, but the package as a whole is like, wow, when was the last time I played a game like this? And I don't have an answer because basically Until Dawn is a movie and you get to be the director. You get to play through it, decide who stays and who goes, and ultimately be the master of fates of all of these teenagers. I liked how there was always consequence at every turn. I liked how your choices really dramatically impact things. I love the mystery and intrigue. And even though they did have quite a bit of uh, foreshadowing and, and showed their hand maybe a little too early, I thought the overall reveal was really a good one. I love the sort of back and forth between the interrogation slash uh, therapist room and the game. I liked how sometimes things weren't what they seemed. I liked how people sometimes weren't what they seemed. And I like the, the, the quick time events. Am I a bad person for saying that? Am I a bad gamer for really liking that? I don't know. But in this instance, QTEs were really fun. And they really added a lot of sweat 
and intensity to the game. I hope to see this kind of a thing done with other stories. It doesn't have to be Until Dawn 2. It doesn't have to be uh, a horror movie, but I'd love to see Supermassive take this and do something else. Find another cool storyline, find another mystery-filled plot, and put us right in the thick of it and have us decide how it goes, who lives and who dies, and what the ending is. I'd love to see even more variety uh, in that next follow-up title. A special game all around, and even more special because it wasn't supposed to be so special, and it's very, very awesome to see the developer getting all the accolades and, and all the praise heaped upon them. They deserve it. They, they did something really good, and it's always fun to see a studio that you don't expect greatness from come at you with something really, really good. And again, if you can get past the hokey dialogue, if you can get past some of the dumb, annoying characters, I'm looking at you, Emily, then you will have a really, really cool experience that only lasts a couple of hours and is something that isn't really recreated in any other franchise that we've seen this generation or maybe any before it. I like the fact that in 2015, some games took big risks and some games created new genres all their own and some games weren't afraid to bring a new IP and new ideas and say, we hope you like it. And luckily for Supermassive and Until Dawn, it really paid off. We're now at the top three, and kicking off this final trio is Splatoon. What a freaking crazy train ride Splatoon is. A game about squids and kids splooshing ink around arenas. Ends up being the coolest game on Wii U and one of the coolest games of the year. How does this happen? Nintendo brings out a new IP. It looks to be a dead-on-arrival dud in the water, and yet Splatoon... It's just Splatoon, man. There is nothing quite like it yet again on this list. Another eccentric, extraordinary title. The multiplayer is really fun. It's maintained a player base. They provided tons of free content, and it feels wholly original. You're running around for three minutes, shooting ink as fast as you can, making routes throughout the maps, challenging yourself to get a high score. Sometimes you don't even kill other people, and that's what's really cool here. This shooter isn't about shooting people. It's about shooting ink and painting the world. I love the fact that they took a concept that we know so well, flipped it around, and then executed it supremely. Splatoon also has a single-player mode that I feel never gets any mention. That's a really fun single player mode. It's chock full of levels. They teach you a lot of the mechanics that you can apply to single player and it utilizes the ink and the characters in ways that is never seen in multiplayer. The bosses are super original. It ends and culminates with a battle against a super octopus who makes sick beats on his DJ turntable. I... Where did that come from? How did they come up with this? I have no idea. But both sides of this game, single and multi, are fantastic. I love the different arenas. I love sort of this Japanese sushi vibe that you got going on. There's gear. There's upgrades. Even the one-on-one mode is really fun for local multiplayer. But that online, man, the fact that they were able to integrate Splatfest and kind of this community sense and constant different challenge and whatnot and and bring in more modes that probably weren't as good as the original mode but still offered another new take on how to do a shooter without shooting bullets at people's face is really really sweet i applaud nintendo but it's not just an applause for being you original and taking a chance and a risk it's an applause because they did something that turned out super super great again Games that take risk and turn out awesome. That is the theme for this 2015 game of the year. And Splatoon is probably top of the food chain. It's even more remarkable to me that in 2015, in an era and world full of guns and gore and girls and glory, we get a game about squids and kids and ink. And it captures as many sales as it did. And it captures as many gamers as it did. Sure, I wish it sold more. Sure, I wish it got more awards. Sure, I wish it was, heck, even on top of my list. But Splatoon is a fine product worthy of any Wii owner and really worthy of any gamer's collection. I think this is a must-buy title for the platform it's on and maybe even the system seller if you're interested in Wii U. Splatoon, I love you, baby. We've reached the final two, and at number two is Batman Arkham Knight. Wait. Wait, do I see a tie for number two? Yes, I do, but let's talk about Batman first. Why does this game get so much crap? 
Why isn't Batman higher up on everybody's list? It's one of the rare AAA games where they said, you know what? We're going to focus on mechanics over everything. The reason I love Batman is very simple. It plays incredibly well. Whether you're flying through the city, whether you're fighting thugs, whether you're destroying tanks in the Batmobile, or whether you're entering and exiting buildings in their seamless, loadless world, Batman Arkham Knight is awesome. It is an amazing final part of the Arkham trilogy. And while that trilogy actually has four games, and some people will argue that Asylum was the best, I think Knight is either the second best or maybe even tied for first. The world is really big and beautiful. Flying around, transporting around, whether in car, on foot, or via cape, feels incredible. There's a ton of villains. And let's talk about what nobody seems to mention about this game, which is the Joker inclusion. That storytelling device, that dialogue and plot mechanic is brilliant. The fact that they have Joker following you around in your head, constantly talking about everything, constantly making little quips about this and that, and mocking you and egging you on, and, and making you question yourself and not know what's really going on is so freaking unique. It's a very, very, very awesome story device. I don't see it being done anywhere else, and it adds so much to a game which could feel super sterile. It's nighttime, there's nobody around, you're flying through the city, and yet you have this partner character that follows you everywhere but hates you. It offers so much insight into both men, the Joker and Batman, and functions as sort of a pseudo-commentary on all of your encounters and experiences, kind of like a YouTube commentator but with a really weird smile and stupid green hair. It was great. I've never really seen it be done before. I loved how it provided almost this second storyline throughout the storyline and this inner battle within Batman. Super smart design. Let's not forget also the ending was super smart. I love when endings of games are kind of a curveball. They throw a mechanic or a character or a perspective that you've never seen before and flip things upside down. That's what the Arkham Knight ending did. I don't want to spoil it, but it was super cool and I was like whoa I can't believe they did this this is what the kind of thing I would do if I was designing games now the DLC is not what I would do it was totally lackluster in the season pass sucked in a lot of ways but the base game is great the mechanics are super sound the controls are crisp the combat is dare I say revolutionary for how many other titles it's impacted since uh, its inception in Arkham Asylum and it's just one of my favorite franchises all around Arkham Knight a great cherry on top for the Arkham series and a standout stellar title for 2015. There's another game that is equally stellar, and for a lot of the same reasons, I really enjoyed it for many of, of the same things and same points as Arkham Knight, and it's not getting the accolades just like Arkham Knight, and so I felt like giving them the same slot was the right thing to do. Is it really fair? Is there now 11 games on my list? No and yes, but it's my list, so I feel like I can do what I want, and I was hoping that this other game, which is Rise of the Tomb Raider, also at number two, would elevate itself above Batman, but its ending didn't impress me in the way that I wanted it to. It didn't leave me with the, the taste of delicious applesauce in my mouth that I wanted. Those Trader Joe's three-stripe popsicles that I love so much kind of wasn't the best, so I'm going to put them in the same spot. Rise of the Tomb Raider, I think, is just the perfect rebuttal for the open-world craze that has seemingly taken over gaming this generation. In this title, they put open world segments. They have fun side quests that take advantage of, once again, well-controlled mechanics and an awesome character that moves with ease and with fun and enough challenge to make it interesting, but enough simplicity to keep it fast-paced and cool. Those open segments are really something. But then between those open world segments where you can go and accomplish kind of mindless side tasks and talk to quest givers and wander around collecting collectibles, you have linear segments where the designers were able to piece together sections and scenes and, and tentpole moments that they put in place. We don't need a game to be entirely open. We don't need a game to be entirely linear. I like this merging of the two philosophies, and it's done and executed so well because A, Lara Croft has turned into a really cool and awesome character. B, the world that they've invented is really uh, visceral and realistic and fun, minus the, the paranormal stuff. And again, mechanically, control-wise, it's just a 
darn good well-designed, wonderful game. The hands-on controller experience here is top-notch, and that's something that matters a lot to me. Mario did it well in the 80s. Mario still does it well in the 2010s. Very few other games do it well. There are titles that got left off this list precisely because they do not play well. I don't care how bold your vision is. I don't care how big your world is. I don't care how cool your future is. If you don't play well, it's hard for me to like it. Rise of the Tomb Raider plays stupendously and as an explore adventure game this may be one of the best ever created i think uncharted 4 is going to need to nail what they do in order to live up to it because the gunplay and the upgrades and the character progression in rise is really something it's a huge improvement over the first tomb raider reboot and i think this goes down as possibly the top title in its genre. I don't know exactly how you label that genre. You want to call it adventure. You want to call it action adventure. You want to call it explore adventure. You want to call it explore action. I don't care, but Rise of the Tomb Raider needs to be played. I'm sad that it came out the same day as Fallout 4 because it did not get any of the attention it deserved. It's on PC now. Go play it there. It's on Xbox One still and dropping in price. Go play it there. It'll be out on PS4 later this year. Go play it there. It's a beautiful game. The graphics are great. It controls awesome. The gunplay is really good. The upgrades are fun and worth it. The exploration is as satisfying as anything. The hidden tombs have some clever puzzles. The world is wonderful to explore. And the merging between open world and linear gameplay is really great and something I don't see being done really anywhere else. I'm frankly pretty sick of open world games, the million things to do. Tomb Raider gives you some sections with quite a few things to do, but never goes over the top and still remembers that this is a game that's supposed to play like a video game and be designed and pull you forward because the designers pull you forward, not because you pull yourself forward because another exclamation point appears on the map. Rise of the Tomb Raider is wonderful. I wish I could give it game of the year. I really do. I think if there's any game on this list that wins game of the year for me, that isn't my game of the year, if that makes any sense, it's this one. I think that Rise of the Tomb Raider is possibly the best game of the year. Ultimately, I went with my favorite game of the year for my game of the year, but Rise of the Tomb Raider, man oh man, that is a freaking great game. And everyone should play it. I wish it had the hype of the others. But Batman and Tomb Raider, they get kind of shoved under some of the more you know, excitable titles, but they're two amazing games. And they're, I think, the two best designed games of 2015. And if I had to give you what was the best game of 2015, it would be down to one of those two. But that is not my game of the year because I decided that for my game of the year this year, I would go with the game that gave me the best memories, the most fun, the most excitement, and that I felt the deepest connection to. I went with the game that I could wholly own as my game of the year. I had a hard time finding a true runaway winner in 2015. I thought all in all, it was a good year, but not an exceptional year. I thought there were a lot of great games, but very few incredible games. I thought it was a good year for smaller titles and kind of a lackluster year for the AAA. But one game stands out for me. Some of you can probably guess it. Some of you have probably already shut off the video. Some of you knew what it was from the start. But my game of the year 2015 is Evolve. I know. I know. Seems like nobody likes this game anymore. They had a really piss poor marketing plan. They made some bad decisions with DLC. But underneath it all is what I'm happy to crown the most unique game of this generation. They are taking an idea that nobody else is taking. Be a video game boss against four human players in a big arena where you have full control and you have crazy creatures to play as. The DLC also came out in 2015, and while people did not like the price points or the release structure, the DLC is incredibly good. Behemoth and Gorgon are the two most fun monsters to play. Their environmental navigation and environmental manipulation is almost mind-blowing. The fact that Behemoth creates rock walls in the environment and rolls down trenches, the fact that Gorgon can hang up on almost any surface with a web is ridiculous. This game is pushing the limits of what games traditionally do, especially from a multiplayer standpoint, and especially from a character-driven multiplayer standpoint. How many games let you be a boss? How many games let you be a giant monster? How many games 
feel incredible and dexterous being that giant monster. The games I've played before where you get to be a boss involve mashing a button to stomp. They're more of playing as a giant mech or a robot where you've got two different moves and you can fire the missiles or you can stomp the feet or you can blow the fire or you can punch. But in Evolve, you get to be a Godzilla creature. You get to be a floating teleporting creature. You get to be a flying Cthulhu moose creature. You get to be a giant deadly spider creature. You get to be a rock monster that can roll really fast and then pound super hard. And that's not even talking about the hunter side of things where the guns and the mechanics are crazy and creative compared to what we see in Call of Duty and Battlefront and Battlefield and Halo and the rest. Evolve doesn't get the credit it deserves at all. Was it executed as as well as it could have been? Did it have the content it should have had? Was the unlock structure as, as wonderful as it could have been? No. But again, for me, Evolve, since E3 of 2014, when I walked into their booth and had no idea what this thing would play like, just knew it was from the Left 4 Dead guys, and I love those games, I have been totally, totally enraptured ever since. And I still love to play it, it saddens me that there's not a whole lot of community there, but the community that is around is a wonderful one. They're very invested in the game. They're very hardcore, almost too hardcore. I was hoping that Evolve could be the game where I turned into a pro or something, but man, those PC players just blow me out of the water and have the, the dedication and the desire and the time that I just don't think I'll ever have. But the fact that I got to play it at a tournament level for a little bit, the fact that I got to you know, play a bunch of different hunters that all felt very different and take on roles that are roles from other games but yet involve different mechanics and different tricks and tactics than anything else we've seen you're you're capturing a monster you're going on a hunt for a giant creature what other game comes close to doing this it's a symmetrical multiplayer in the grandest sense of the word you have a humongous creature versus four tiny guys but in those four tiny guys you got four distinct roles and you've got five unique characters. Now there's even more variety within those five characters. And most people hate microtransactions, but I love the skins here. I thought it was a super cool way to really distinguish yourself as a monster or even a hunter player to have a different look and let people see you as a blood red spider or as a rainbow colored wraith or as a really blue and weird exotic rock. That's super awesome. Nobody had to buy that stuff. Nobody had to buy any of it. I still think the base game is really fun. I still think the evacuation quote-unquote campaign isn't a campaign, but it's got a good idea behind it. And the only mode that ended up mattering to people was Hunt. But there's another mode that most people never got to see, and that's Arena. Arena was a fantastic way to drop people in, give them a quick couple-minute enjoyable session of Evolve, and I wish that was there at launch. I think if Evolve had launched with Hunt and Arena, then it would have been a different story. I think if Evolve had launched with the Tier 4 and Tier 5 Hunters instead of the Tier 1 and Tier 2, it would have been a different story. The personality and the charm of those Hunters and Monsters really grew as the game progressed, and most people, unfortunately, didn't get to see that. My favorite monsters are Gorgon and Behemoth. My favorite hunters are the Tier 4 and Tier 5, and most people have no idea they even exist or what they look like because they were so burned by the initial plan. I personally think it wasn't that bad. I think that the media and the PR and the world of mouth kind of wrapped it into this big bundle of flaming fire that it didn't need to be and really wasn't. Tons of people sell DLC. Tons of people have season passes. Somehow Evolve kind of got worked over worse than any of the others. And maybe it's because it's a new IP. Maybe it's because it is mostly online only. But you can play that thing totally by yourself. You can play that thing offline. I really like playing the monster against AI. I think if you bump the AI and set some of the parameters uh, to be against you, it's a really fun experience. The monster is where it's at. If you only see Evolve from the Hunter experience, you're missing out on what the game really stands for and what the game really does in such a ridiculously creative, unique way. No other game lets you play as a boss character and feel the sense that you are an unstoppable force, growing, modifying, and moving as a humongous creature, just chopping away at the health of your opponents and to know that they're humans and to know that they're being controlled and to know that they have strategies. The scenarios and some of the moments that get set up within that structure are phenomenal and I found it to be exciting and upsetting and terrifying and tense 
and ultimately a heck of a lot of fun. And I know that games are meant to be fun, and I know that I, for one, forget that quite often. I'm looking to criticize and critique and find, you know, the real gem. But the reason that I did what I did with my game of the year this year is because I want to focus on sometimes the greatest games aren't the ones that are most talked about. Sometimes the greatest games aren't the ones that are the, the best designed. And I'm reminding myself of this because sometimes I forget that. And I hope that in 2016 I can be a little more open-minded about what I enjoy. I still feel strongly that mechanics should be valued over everything. I still feel strongly that this open-world craze needs to stop and that we're running the industry into a scary place by not valuing any sort of quality over quantity and putting so much weight into the number of hours and missions that devs and pubs can pack into their titles versus the actual content and what that means to you and how you experience it. I'm the kind of person that would take a three hour incredible insane adventure over a 30 hour boar fest. But it seems like in today's day and age, we are sucked in by the fact that you can be this hunter for 7,000 hours. You can be this assassin for 6 million years. You can be this detective for 10 trillion months. I we see it even with titles coming out in 2016. They're so hyped by their longevity and they're so hyped by their replayability. I like something that gives me a great memory once. And Evolve did that. And Batman did that. And Life is Strange did that. And SteamWorld Heist did that. And I still replay some of them. So it's not all or nothing, nothing or all. There's a way to achieve a mix. But I think we get so wrapped up in hype and what we're supposed to like, and what people say we should like, and what we see our friends liking, and YouTubers liking, and it's just this this, this snowball effect of someone says, oh my god, this game's amazing, and then everyone says this game's amazing, and then before you even play it, you know it's your game of the year, and then you play it, and even if it's not that great, it's already your game of the year, and you don't know really what to do, and you're loving it for reasons that really don't even make sense, and then at the end of the day, we don't get the most quality games we can, and I'm not saying I want all games I like. I know stuff like The Witness isn't for everyone. I know stuff like Evolve isn't for everyone. But I wish always that we get the best games we can. And I think we need to push developers and push publishers and challenge these companies to create quality experiences that are unique, diverse, and at the end of the day, just really, really good. And something that's really, really good to me deserves accolades over something that's just really expansive or really big or really, you know, the continuation of a favorite franchise. You know what? I look on this list, and how many of these games have IP and franchises that most people don't even know about? Rocket League, what the heck is that IP? Life is Strange, what's that IP? Until Dawn, Splatoon, Evolve, SteamWorld Heist. Six of my top ten are either new IPs or really weird, unique IPs, and I'm glad that that's the case. I hope 2016 continues that craze with stuff like The Witness and Horizon and more. I'm fine having really great sequels, and I hope we get them. I hope Titanfall 2, whenever that releases, delivers an out-of-this-world shooter experience. I hope that the new Deus Ex and Mirror's Edge are mind-blowingly amazing. But I think we need to remember that what made gaming so popular and so great was that the games were so great. And the more that gets diluted, and the more it gets just spread so thin, sure, it may look good now, sure, it may work fine for, for, for this year and next year and the year after that, but eventually, I think people will look back and, and go, wow, gaming has really soured, and it's really gotten so samey, and it's really gotten so blah and sterile. And we need great designers to take big chances, and we need great developers to have our support, and we need great publishers to see that we will buy these titles that aren't just labeled part six and part seven and have a familiar face on the box art. And I'm proud that my list has diversity. I'm proud that a lot of people's list has diversity. I'm proud that in 2016, I can already sense we're going to get some top tier games from places we may not have expected. I'm excited to try out other genres and other franchises, stuff like XCOM that I previously wouldn't have been that into because I want to expand not only my experiences and my horizons and my little box that I live in, but hopefully spread that to you guys. And I hope that this list did that for some of you. I hope that you found a game that maybe you haven't really considered or that you heard of but forgot to play or maybe one that you had never even seen before at all. And I hope that this list uh, finally delivers what I promised I would deliver, which is my game of the year 2015. All in all, 
I love video games. I loved what I played in 2015. I hope 2016 is even better. I hope this generation finds franchises that it can dig its teeth into. I hope it finds its Bioshocks and its Assassin's Creed and its Gears of Wars and its Batman Arkhams and its Uncharted's and its everything. Because so far we've been stuck in repetition and just taking what we know and making it bigger. That doesn't necessarily mean better, just bigger. Let's start making games that are better and let's start making new types of games that may be even better than anything we could have imagined. Guys and girls, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sticking around for this long video. I hope you had a fun time. I hope you got what you came for. And I hope we have an amazing 2016 in every way imaginable. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks so much for being a part of my channel. Thanks so much for being here for some of these games. Maybe you watch all of them on my channel. Maybe you watch one of them or five of them. I love you so much. And I thank you for your support all the same. Until next time, guys and girls, where next year I will make this list a lot more polished, a lot better, and highly produced. But at least we did it in 2015. Drink some hot chocolate. Until next time, we will see you all later.